In Isaiah 7, we will find one of the most precious promises in all of Scripture. One of the most sweet portions, verses, that would ever mark one of the pages of Scripture. You will not find this promise too often carved onto a wooden plaque and sold at a boutique store. You won't find this promise very often on Facebook or Instagram or any other social media site as a liked graphic. You will not normally find this promise printed onto shirts or hats or even shoes as we have found other promises of Scripture. Yet in Isaiah chapter 7, we have, in my opinion, one of the most precious promises found in all of Scripture. It's found in verse number 14. If you look there, please, in your Bibles. Where the Bible says the promise of God, on the authority of God himself, on the veracity of his character and his power and who he is, it says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and to bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The wonder of a Savior. Oh, there are promises that you will cling to. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. But my friends, those promises would hold no authority, no power, without this promise right here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The promise of the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Based upon not a symbol in this earth, but upon none other than God himself. His character, his authority, and his power. The wonder of a Savior, the majesty of a virgin birth, the glory and the meaning of that simple word, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Do you know why God can be with you tonight and you can be with God? Isaiah 7 verse 14. You know why tomorrow morning when you wake up, no matter what happens tomorrow, why you can travel that day with grace and with strength and with confidence and and with joy? You know why? Because Emmanuel, God with us. Do you know why one day you will shed this earthly vessel and you'll be glorified and translated in the likeness of, of dear Savior Jesus Christ? You know why? Because of Emmanuel, God with us. One of the sweetest most powerful promises. Can there be anything more precious than the reality that God is with us? And that God became man and became sin so that we did not have to pay for our sin, so that life can be infinitely different because of Emmanuel, God with us. Can there be anything more touching than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. But what you may not realize is though this promise is as powerful a promise in all of Scripture, and as wonderful as any other promise of Scripture, and as life-changing as it is, you may not know that this promise was given verbally not to a group of faithful believers. It was not imparted at the time and in the moment to those who were clinging to God, to his way and his word, to those who were faithfully sacrificing and worshiping. No, it was given to a bunch of pagans who who had rejected Jesus Christ. Tonight, with the Lord's help, I want to take apart this passage of Isaiah chapter 7, which will end up in verse number 14 with this thought. The Lord always declares himself. The Lord always declares himself. Tonight, with the the Lord's help, we'll look at what is happening here in Isaiah chapter 7. 
I believe there are some uh, similarities to lives uh, around us, and perhaps even some in this building, where God is not at the forefront. And I love what Brother Erickson said this morning, God is faithful. Did you know that God is faithful? I know that. I've mentioned this uh, maybe one or two times before, but I missed that on a Bible test when I was in college. It's found in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and on the particular class, the class was Corinthians, the book of Corinthians, and it was a test over chapter number one. And there's a number of characters given in chapter number one of Corinthians, Chloe, whose house they were meeting at next to the synagogue, and some other characters as well. And the question of the test was, who is faithful? And I, like a normal Christian, began to overthink the question. You ever overthink the question? Come on now, you ever overthink the question? I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about the test in Bible class, I'm talking about the test of life. You ever overthink the question? What am I supposed to do? Where am I going? What's going on? You overthink the question. And I sat there. I still remember where I was at in that alumni building. I think it was room 211 at that little gray desk and chair, sitting there looking, sweating over that question, who is faithful? And I'm like, it's not Chloe. She's not faithful. I know that. I mean, she was a good woman. She, it doesn't say she's faithful. And I missed it. I don't know who I said was faithful that day, but I didn't say God. I got that test back and wrong. God is. Oh, of course. Of course, that's the obvious question. That's like any question you ask a young person when they come home from Sunday school. What did you learn about Jesus? <laughs> Not a bad answer. Not a bad answer, my friend. But tonight, don't overthink the question. You know who's faithful? You know who will declare himself? It's God. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. This is not a sign from another prophet. This is not a sign uh, from another nation. This is a sign from God himself, a promise from God himself. We're going to understand w- with the Lord's help why this was so important to see God declaring himself to these people. So that's the Lord's blessing and help on this time. Lord, we sure do love you. And we thank you for this time. Lord, we come humbly tonight uh, requesting your help, needing your, your grace during these next few moments. Lord, would you please illuminate this portion of Scripture? I've tried to do my part in study. Lord, I want to try to articulate these things well, but without you, I can do nothing. And Lord, if it's just a a service where we just read something and hear a few thoughts, it would be useless. Lord, if you show up, if you touch us tonight, if you move among us, then this service has eternal value and help. So Lord, I pray for that tonight. I pray that you would touch us, that you would change us, and may we respond to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We're going to begin Isaiah chapter 7. We're going to have to go to a couple other portions of Scripture and then come back to Isaiah chapter 7. That will give us a context for what's happening. And if you look, please, and begin in, in verse number 1, where the Bible says, And it came to pass, Isaiah 7 verse 1, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Razan, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, what we must understand is a few things in the background. If you'll notice in in verse number one, we're going to come to understand about a a king by the name of Ahaz, who was the grandson of Uzziah. You see that in in verse number one? Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah. See that? So you got son, dad, and grandpa. If you happen to turn back a page, your mind's on the same page, Isaiah chapter 6, we find out, and that's where we're at uh, uh, two Sundays ago, the sermon, When I See the King. And that sermon, that Isaiah chapter 6 begins in the year that King Uzziah died. And so we've had, from Isaiah 6 to Isaiah chapter 7, probably 16 to 18 years have happened in this passage of time. In Isaiah chapter 6, we have the renewed call of Isaiah. He saw God high and lifted up, and then for a portion of time, probably 16 years, he's been preaching the message of God, none of which we have recorded. You see, God didn't record everything for us. He recorded everything he wanted for us, but other things happened. And so for 16 years, Isaiah, the prophet of God, has been faithfully, has been diligently, has been consistently preaching about God and and turning toward God and living a life toward God. And we come to Ahaz. Ahaz, now in verses 1 and 2, we find out that Ahaz 
and the country has now been attacked. And there is a Syrian, the Assyrian army has come up against Jerusalem to besiege it and to overthrow it. So in essence, life isn't going well. Life is not all hunky-dory. It's not all wonderful. Things are not flowing well. There's some issues going on. They're trying to be overthrown. There are enemies outside the gates, outside the walls, who are trying to absolutely eradicate and destroy and to kill and take over captive every single child of Israel, Jerusalem. But the Bible says here in verse number one that they've warred against Jerusalem, but they could not prevail against it. So they haven't won yet, but life is not good. There are battles. They can look out their front door and every day see the enemies of God and see the opposition to, uh, of their way of life. And so they're living in a place, they're living in a time where there's a constant bombardment of opposition. You ever feel like we live in a time of constant bombardment of opposition? Where every bit of God is being opposed? Where the enemy, the wicked one, the evil one, would like nothing less than to overthrow every single person in this building? The devil wants to destroy every bit of your life. He can't, if you trusted Christ, he cannot destroy your eternal destination. He cannot snatch heaven away from you. The Bible says that once you're saved, you're in the Father's hand, and nothing, no one can pluck you out of his hand, not even the devil. But he would love, he would love nothing less than to cause every bit of your life to be useless to the cause of Christ. He'd love for marriages to be blown up, for children to reject the authority of their parents. He'd love you never to come back to First Baptist Church, to never worship again, to never open your Bible again. He would love all of that. There's opposition all around us. I love seeing uh, Nate and Abby back in the night. Joined this morning and back here tonight. Man, God bless you guys. I saw Nick over there. Nick joined a couple weeks ago. Went soul winning yesterday with Brother Ryan, didn't you? God bless you. The devil's fighting all that. And Ahaz, the children of Israel, were seeing that. If you would... Mark, mark your place here in Isaiah. We've got to turn, though, uh, back to 2 Kings. We're going to read about Ahaz a little bit before we get to the point of this passage. We'll go to 2 Kings, and, and then we'll be in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. 2 Kings, chapter number 16, please. Second Kings chapter 16, beginning verse number 1. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. You understand who we're talking about now? Same thing we found in Isaiah chapter uh, 7, verse 1. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. A little test time. Was Ahaz a good king or a bad king? He was a bad king. Not because of his economic policies. Not because of his financial decisions. But because he didn't follow God. The Bible says he didn't follow God like, like David his father had. Now what's this is amazing. This is, just, this is a free side note. Often in Scripture, when we come to the king's they will, all, they will almost always be compared back to David. Now, David is not their, their direct father. He's a lineage father. But David, in spite of his failings, which he had some severe ones, did he not? Bathsheba, numbering the people, he had some severe failings. David followed God. And often, if the kings are compared good or bad, they're compared back to David. You know, David messed up, but he turned back to God. Or he messed up, but he fessed up. And my Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, given to Christians. So the, the stipulation was not, were you perfect, but did you keep on coming back to God even after you, after you blew it? Ahaz didn't. He lived in a wicked way. The Bible says, verse number three, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire. According to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. 
I don't have the time to, to do this, but, but briefly, this is reference to the god Molech. And Molech was a false god of a false nation. And Molech was a huge statue, and Molech would have his belly open in, in, the, in the idol. All right, and they'd build a huge fire, and then they would place a child inside the belly of Molech to sacrifice. I don't know there's young people in here, but, but this was what the children of Israel, who were God's chosen people, children of Judah, this is the place they were at in life. Complete rejection of God. It affected their families. You know that when you reject God, it will affect your family? Dads, you, you reject God, it'll affect your family. Moms, kids, when you reject God, it affects your family. And Ahaz here affected his family. And the Bible says in verse number four, he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and ev- under every green tree. Hey, basically, every, every spot was a place for him to show rejection to God. Verse number five, then Razan, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. So they besieged him. They were a thorn to them. They were a, a opposition to him, but they hadn't won yet. They weren't overthrown yet. There was still hope. There was still an opportunity for them to be saved in this battle. If you would please turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. Then Chronicles chapter 28, beginning verse number 1, a similar account to 2 Kings. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Wherefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away a great multitude. And then we continue on with the passage. I want you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 7. This is the background. This is the background for what I would say is the greatest promise in all of Scripture. The background of a people who are God's chosen people, the Israelites, specifically the the tribe of Judah here. And they've not turned toward God, they've turned away from God. In such rejection that their lives look like nothing to do with God himself. When you're sacrificing your children this way, there is no part of God in your life. And yet they had the revelation of God, they have a prophet of God, but there was no, no view of God at all. There was complete rejection, utter rejection. So now we come to Isaiah chapter 7. That's the background. And God calls upon Isaiah to address the problem. If you would please look, we read verse number 1 and verse number 2. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So what happened was now in the house of David, that means in Ahaz, the, the messengers came and said, oh, you got to be careful because, uh, because Syria, all right, has now joined with Ephraim, all right? They've, they've gained up against you. And the Bible says here that they, the heart of the people were moved like trees are moved with wind. The idea with that is that in a huge hurricane or a storm, all right, when the wind is great, these tall trees that would seemingly not move, when the wind is great, begin to move and bow back and forth. It takes a great wind to move, to move a tree, does it not? And what happened was the news was so great, was so devastating, that as strong as they thought they were, they were moved by this thought. They were shaken by this thought. They realized life is bad. Look at verse number 3. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirah Jashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool and the highway of the fuller's field. Now at this point, I'm going to start to give you four points. Four points, what's going to happen next a little bit. Four points that I believe will be helpful to you and to, and to I tonight. The first point is this. 
in every situation, in every area of life, God always sends a messenger. God always sends a messenger. It may be a praying mother. It may be a godly friend. It may be an obedient Christian. It may be the witness of himself. Romans chapter 1 says that, that these things, this nature itself, witnesses of God. But God always sends a messenger. It is an inescapable truth that no one is immune to the messenger of God. In the darkest corners of the deepest tribes in Africa, God has, still has a witness of himself. God always sends a messenger. And at this time with Ahaz, when there was opposition, all right, when there was fighting, when it appeared no hope, God sent a messenger. The messenger may appear differently than we imagine. It may not be how we want it or where we want it, but God always sends a messenger. And my friends, in your life, if you can remember, maybe right now you're in a spot in life where you've turned away from God in an area or completely in your life. God is still, all right, speaking, and God is sending a messenger to you. And too often, people want to kill the messenger. Sometimes it's the pastor, and they want to knock out the pastor. Some of you have said, you, you, I'll finish the message, and you're like, Pastor, did my wife or my husband, did they call you this week? Because you were, like, right at me this week. And the answer is, of course they did. What do you think my weeks are full with? Of course. It's your spouse or your parents or your kids calling me and saying, listen, Pastor, preach on this this Sunday. How, how do you think I get my messages? All right, and if you don't call by Wednesday, I'll call you. Okay, listen, you know, Brother Ash, what does Marie need this week? And, and boy, and he's like, I mean, that's always a good one. No, it's not there. That's the other way around right there. No, my friends, it's the Holy Spirit who loves. It's God Almighty who lovingly draws us back to himself. God sends a messenger. And Ahaz and the children of Israel, they're under siege, yet God sent a messenger. Aren't you thankful that God sends a messenger? Now don't say amen too loudly, because all of us have been unthankful for it. All of us have been like, I don't want to hear that right now. Come on now, you with me so far? You, come on, you've been there. It could be kids, your parents. Right, Levi, your parents and your dad or your mom, like, listen, this is, that's not right attitude. And God sent a message right to your parents. You're like, I don't want to hear that right now. God always sends a messenger. Some of you, it's your spouse sometimes. Praise the Lord for that. If you have a godly spouse, praise the Lord for a godly spouse. Who sometimes is the messenger of God in your life. Even when you don't want to hear it. Hopefully you've heard some, some messages from God here from the pulpit. God always sends a messenger. And Isaiah, in this passage, was God's messenger. But it's interesting to me that in verse number 3, that, he, that the Lord says this, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shira Jashub thy son. Isaiah, you're going to go meet Ahaz, and you're going to take your son with you. Now we have to ask ourselves, why did Isaiah take his son? I mean, was the son bulking up? Was he like Isaiah's bodyguard? Was Isaiah's son going to be a prophet for God and, and he needed to, to learn a lesson on how to, how to prophesy correctly? Uh, no. God not only sends a messenger, but God often sends an example. The name of Isaiah's son is the example for the children of Israel. The name means, the name means a remnant shall return. It does not imply that they'll just return physically, but it implies that they will return spiritually. What God was showing in the example was that people will still, still turn back to me. You know, you have to wonder sometimes, why does it seem that the ranks of God and Christians are few? Why does it seem that many people are on the wrong path? Jesus said it, right? There's a broad way and a narrow way. And on the broad way, many there be that find it. On the narrow way, few there be that find it. 
Now, I'm not here saying tonight, well, First Baptist Church is the only one that found it. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this, that as we look at the truth from the Word of God, there will be a majority who will not, who will, who will reject God, who will not turn toward Him, but there will always be those who will turn to God. And in their turning to God, they will condemn, they will condemn everyone else. You see, people look for an excuse not to turn to God. Some of you have family members, and you've turned toward God, and they haven't. By your remnant returning, you've demonstrated it's possible to return to God. Some of you work in a workplace where you're the only Christian. You're the only one who loves God, who knows God, who calls on his name. And the others may say, well, this place is too tough. We've seen too much of humanity. My friends, by your walk with God, you condemn And God told Isaiah, take your son there, because by that name, by his name, he will demonstrate, he will remind, he will show that a remnant will return. Now the natural thought is, hope it's Ahaz. Hope it's his people right here. You see, God not only has a message, or a messenger, and God often gives a reminder, but God always has a a message number three. Let's look at the message here. Verse number four. And say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Now we'll read the rest of it in just a minute. But here's the message that God sent, and this is, this is kind of the crux of the message tonight. The message that God sent is simple. It is not complex. It is not earth-shattering news. The message of God is not different than you've heard almost any other week since First Baptist Church has been in existence. The message is simple. It is plain. It is easy to follow and hear. But the message is this. Trust God. It's the whole message. Trust God. That's it. You know how you're saved? Trust God. You know how you're supposed to live after you're saved? Trust God. That's the message. Like that, is, that is the message. All right? From the beginning pages, in the beginning, God, like, I trust him that he did it. Throughout the Bible, it is, I can either lean on anything else in my, in my entire life, my own thoughts, my own way, my own idols, the, the God of Molech and Balaam. I can do all those things. Or I can simply and solely, completely trust God. And the message here was the same message you and I have. Trust God. Turn to God. In fact, it's a message found throughout the Bible. If you seek me, you will find me. God said that. Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Jonah, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Revelation, Jesus says this, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. You ever wonder why it comes back to some of these simple truths in life? You're like, man, you know, Pastor, give me something like crazy I've never heard before. You know why? Because the message of the Bible is simple. Yet we miss the simple. We miss it. Anybody want to, with a raise of hand, attest the fact that you've learned the same lesson from God multiple times in life? And how many would say, you know what, it ends up being like faith. Like, am I going to trust him this time? Now, We've walked by faith, we've seen him answer these prayers and these requests and these issues, but we come here, we're like, oh boy, is he going to let me down this time? 
And yet the same, the same question comes up, am I going to trust God or not? And the message is simple, the message is profound, but it's the same message because we still don't get it. And we can point fingers at Ahaz and we can say, wow, I can't believe how far from God you went. But you and I turn from God in a similar fashion. Now, I hope we don't sacrifice our child the same way, but there are families who have come to First Baptist Church who have sacrificed their children to the God of their own logic, to the God of financial freedom, because they've trusted their own way. And maybe they've never physically thrown their child into the burning belly of Molech, but they tossed him into the sea of ruin because they don't trust God. It's a simple message. It's the same message from the first page to the last page. Trust God. We still struggle with our own flesh, but when we walk with him, abide with him, rely upon him, lean on him, rest in him, deny ourselves for him. It's all the same. When we trust him, we find victory. We find peace. We find joy. We find everything that we're really searching for when we simply trust God. And so Isaiah has a, has a task. Isaiah, take your son. Go to this wicked king who's in opposition, who has trouble, who has a problem. Take this example of, of your son by his name uh, with you and teach this, preach this simple message. You have a problem. God's bigger than your problem. Trust him. Here's what he says here, please. Verse number 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now, don't look at verse number 12 yet, please. Don't jump ahead yet. What an awesome thing God said. God said, Isaiah, tell Ahaz, ask me a sign. Any sign you want to see, I'll do it for you. Now, that, that promise, just so you know, is, is not given to you and to me tonight. All right, God is not saying tonight, listen, ask me a sign, and I will do that. If you want to see the sun stand still, and, and I believe what the Scripture says, is if, if he'd asked for the sun to stand still, he would have seen it stand still. That does not mean if you pray tonight, well, I'm taking Ahaz's promises and sun stand No, 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 no. But what was happening is God was saying through Isaiah, listen, Ahaz, you can trust me. And I will prove myself to you. Right? Does not the Bible say, prove me, say it to the Lord? Like God, God says, I will show you myself. And for you, Ahaz, I will show you in any way you want to see it. Any way. Now, my friends, just for a moment, let your mind wander. All right? Get distracted. What if God said that to you tonight? Ask me any sign you want to see, and I'll do it tonight. Come on, let your mind go somewhere. Say, man, you know what? If I could ask anything, then God, I would ask for, and fill in that blank. Man, some of you are like, boy, you know what? I'd ask God for a billion dollars. Come on, anybody, anybody guilty for the money thing? Come on, Nathan, you're shaking your head a little, little, little guilty right there. Listen, that is, no offense, man, that is so small. God's like, man, that, that's my, I'm going to send my paving company down for Nathan's request. You know, someone else is like, you know what, Lord? I want to fly. Really? You want to fly? We're going to fly one day anyway. But let your mind wander if God said, if God said to you, ask me any request, and I will show you. And then the Bible says, height nor depth doesn't matter. Man, would you not just like, whoa, whoa, give me a second. All right, let me think about this for a minute. And I'm like, I want to make, I get, I get run requests, I'm going to make it a good one. I'm going to make it a good one. That's not what Ahaz says. Look now in verse number 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask neither will I tempt the Lord. Now Ahaz is not saying this to be pious. He's not saying, how you first read it, it sounds like he's like, no, no, I won't ask the Lord anything. I won't tempt the Lord. What he's saying is, I'm not going to turn and trust in God. That's what he's saying. I will not test the Lord. I will lean on what I know, what I see. And Ahaz completely and utterly takes all the dependency that should have been on God and says, you know what? I'll do it myself. What a sad response. The fact is, if God were to come in the night and say to you, ask me anything, some of you would say the same thing. 
No, that's okay, Lord, I'll pass. I'll pass. Let someone else have my blessing. You know what? God wants to bless every single person in this room. And yet Ahaz says, no, it's not for me. And my friends, that is the context for the most precious promise in Scripture. Where God has just been shut down by King Ahaz. And that nation has said, you know what? We don't want to follow God. I don't want him in my life. I don't want him in the nation. I don't want his help. I don't want a sign from him. I will face I will face these kings all by myself and with my own might, my own logic, my own strength. I'll do it all myself. And my friends, here's the final truth. God will always declare himself. God is faithful to himself. And it's from verse 12 we see, or verse 13, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, no matter what way you walk, God will be God. No matter what way you turn, God is God. No matter what, God will demonstrate and declare himself. You can reject, you can resist, you can delay, you can disregard, you can justify yourself, you can make excuses, but God will declare himself. I feel for those who aren't serious about God. I'm burdened for those who won't surrender to God. I pray for those who haven't turned to God. But my friends, God declares himself. Ultimately, God always wins. And you can skip church. You can leave church. You can disregard church. And sure, we'll be sad. We'll miss you. But at the end of the day, God wins. You can ignore your Bible. You can disregard your Bible. You can Set aside your Bible, and I'll try to challenge you, and I'll be burdened, and I'll be sad for you. But ultimately, God always wins. You can sleep through preaching. You can complain about preaching. You can criticize it. And yes, I'll be sad. But ultimately, God always wins. You can live your life in your own logic, in your own path, you can make your own decisions, and many believers, those who claim to know Christ, have. And they live their own life, they make their own decisions, they put their own priorities first, they worship themselves over God, they trust in their own way. And I'm sad and I'm burdened and I pray for them, but ultimately, God declares himself. And this promise given to Ahaz was not fulfilled in the lifetime of anyone who was living that day. It took a thousand more years and more for this promise to be fulfilled. You see, God's declaration and his timetable of himself is not our declaration. That's the deceitfulness of it. We sit there and we say, you know what, look at this. I'm disregarding God. I'm disregarding the church. I'm disregarding his message. And I don't care about the messenger. And, and you know what? Things are pretty good. The enemies have not prevailed against me yet. They've not overthrown me yet. I guess my way's working. I guess my own thoughts are working. But the Lord himself will give you a sign. And one of the most precious promises of Scripture is based upon the fact that a nation who could have found help from God said no way. So tonight, simply, are you listening to the message? Are you trusting God? Not, did you trust him yesterday, but are you trusting him today? Are you living life for him today? If not, God will declare himself. 
And don't forget, when God came to town through Isaiah, it was bad. They were in a place of rejection. And God didn't just knock them off upside the head. God said, listen, I'll show you myself. And tonight you may be in a place where you're like, man, pastor, if you knew all the decisions I've made and how long I've, I've lived in my own logic, I may look good, but, but pastor, I'm living, for, I'm living for myself right now. Well, listen to the message. God says, listen, I'll show you myself. I'll prove myself. Just come and turn to me. And I pray tonight that you will not look at it and say, no, thank you. Because the Lord will always declare himself. Thank you.